the Knights Templar, legendary soldier monks of the Middle Ages. Warriors of God. Holy men, devilish fighters, sworn to poverty, but richer than kings. Legend says they guarded the greatest relic in Christendom, the Holy Grail. A treasure so priceless, it gave them unrivaled power. Yet at their height, the Templars are destroyed and their fortune vanishes. Who were the Knights Templar? And can the true secret of their power be revealed today? March 18, 1314 AD. One of Europe's most powerful men, Jacques de Molay, is about to be executed. The charges against him? Devil worship, sodomy, and financial blackmail. De Molay is one of 69 men burned alive on orders of King Philip IV of France. The condemned belong to one of the most mysterious brotherhoods in history, the Knights Templar. In the Middle Ages, these warriors are feared, wealthy, and powerful. But in 1307, that reign comes to an end. The Templars stand accused of heresy. Under intense interrogation, they crack and confess. Overnight, two centuries of wealth and power go up in smoke. The Knights Templar vanish from history, but leave behind a beguiling mystery. The Templars call themselves the Poor Knights of Christ, yet become one of the richest organizations in Europe. It's here. It's said the source of their wealth is an ancient relic discovered beneath the ruins of the old Jewish temple in Jerusalem. And its fate remains a riddle. To discover the Templar's secret, we must retrace their footsteps back to the beginning, back to the clash of civilizations called the Crusades. 1096 AD, an army of European knights marches thousands of miles to the region they call the Holy Land. Muslim states dominate the Middle East and a region that stretches from Persia to Spain. Pope Urban II calls for a holy war to liberate Christianity's most sacred city, Jerusalem. It takes the Crusaders nearly three years to reach the holy city. Along the way, battle, disease and starvation take their toll. Over 4,000 knights set out for Jerusalem. A little over a thousand arrive. July 1099. After a five-week siege, the Crusaders take the city. When the Crusaders captured Jerusalem, first thing that happened, there was a bloodbath of almighty proportions. They slaughtered everybody, Christian, Jew, Muslim alike. It was not a pretty event. A French eyewitness describes the carnage. Piles of heads, hands, and feet were to be seen on the streets of the city. 
In the temple and porch of Solomon, men rode in blood up to their knees and bridle reins. Indeed, it was a just and splendid judgment of God that this place should be filled with the blood of unbelievers since it had suffered so long from their blasphemies. To rule the new kingdom of Jerusalem, the Crusaders choose from their own ranks. Crusader kings will fight battle after battle to hold this sacred ground. In 1118, they choose their third leader and name him King Baldwin II. King Baldwin receives an offer of help from a Crusader knight. My lord. The French nobleman, Hugh de Payon. Rise. I have a great vision, my lord. Hugh Payen proposed the idea of a contingent of fighting monks whose responsibility would be to guard the Holy Land and to safeguard passage of pilgrims on their way from Europe to the Holy Land and to defend the holy city of Jerusalem. King Baldwin likes the idea and the Templars are born. Thou art a knight of the Templar. Thou art a warrior of God. From a band of nine knights, the Templars knight will swell the into an Thou army of thousands. Of they call themselves the Order of the Poor Knights of the Temple of Solomon. In time, they're simply known as the Knights Templar. They're not only warriors, but monks. They take vows of poverty, obedience, and celibacy. Europe has never seen such a force. The whole idea of a fighting order, a military order, was really a quite extraordinary and indeed even revolutionary idea in the church. How do you combine these two things? Do you pray over your weapons? The answer is yes, that they did. You know, they regarded their calling as a holy calling. The Knights Templar decided they would create what we might think of today as special forces for Christ. Like medieval monks, Templars pray seven times a day. But what makes these monks different is they train to fight. Your first defense is your sword. I guarantee you, you lose this, you will lose your life. When we cut, we cut, we keep going, we do not stop. Is everyone ready? Between those two military orders, you had an extremely efficient, highly disciplined, superbly equipped standing army. Small in number, but incredibly, they packed one hell of a punch. The Templars crush the Muslims at the Siege of Ascalon in 1153, the Battle of Mortizard in 1177, and the Battle of Arsuf in 1191. They seem invincible. The Templars fight by strict rules. They are forbidden to retreat unless ordered to do so, and only when outnumbered by more than three to one. The Templars really were different from other parts of the Crusader army. It was known that they wouldn't break ranks, it was known that they wouldn't run away, that uh, they wouldn't desert. The Templar's Red Cross stands for martyrdom, death in battle is glorious. The key tactical maneuver is the squadron charge. A small group of knights attacks head-on a tightly packed wedge. Their goal? To break the enemy line and scatter the enemy to the right and left. The charge is reckless, terrifying, magnificent.
They famously won many battles, so their respect was incredible. They had a mystique. They had an aura of power. Part of their mystique grows from their headquarters. King Baldwin gives the knights one of Christendom's holiest places, the site of the ancient Jewish temple. Jesus himself once preached here. We found something. Show us. But it's what the Templars uncover here that may have shaped their destiny. Beneath the ancient temple, folklore says the knights make one of the most remarkable discoveries of all time. Nine centuries ago, in one of the holiest places on earth, a primitive archaeological dig begins. It is the site of the ancient Jewish temple in Jerusalem. During the First Crusade, it becomes the headquarters of the Knights Templar. The temple was built by King Solomon in the 10th century BC. Four centuries later, the Babylonians destroy it and the Jews rebuild it. The temple once housed the sacred Ark of the Covenant. In an inner room, the Holy of Holies, it is said God himself lived here. 70 AD, war destroys the house of God. A Roman army crushes a Jewish rebellion. The Romans burn the city and tear down the temple. By the time of the Crusades, the Muslims built a mosque over the ruins of the Jewish temple that still stands, the Dome of the Rock. A small group of fighting monks now occupy part of one of the holiest pieces of real estate in the holiest city on earth. They were housed in the temple complex in Jerusalem and that was a very important statement as far as the importance that they gave to this new order, this new ideal. Not all scholars agree. Frankly, I think the reason is it's sort of an accident. I don't think it was freighted with any kind of real meaning other than it was something available. Scholars also dispute the Templars' original mission, to safeguard pilgrims to the Holy Land. There have been some researchers who say they had nothing to do with assisting pilgrims. And the question remains, of course, what else were they doing? Maybe they were onto something. I spent nine years tunneling through solid rock and then a series of radiating tunnels underneath. What they discovered down there has been a matter of intense speculation ever since. According to one theory, the Templars discover a treasure map. The map is actually a scroll etched in copper, detailing the exact hiding place of the treasures of the Jewish temple. <laughs> 70 AD, as the Roman army conquers Jerusalem, Jewish rebels hide the treasures of the temple throughout the Holy Land. To recover them, they leave directions, etched in copper, to last forever. For centuries, the scroll's very existence is unknown. Then, in 1947, a Bedouin shepherd looking for a stray sheep makes an electrifying discovery. Ancient scrolls, nearly 2,000 years old, some of the oldest Jewish texts ever found. The Dead Sea Scrolls. When the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, amongst them was one called the Copper Scroll. And it listed a series of sites throughout what we would now call the Holy Land where temple treasures had been buried for safekeeping prior to the Roman destruction of the temple. In the 1950s, a British archaeologist follows the clues etched on the Copper Scroll. He finds no Jewish treasure, but learns a previous expedition discovered something just as tantalizing. Clues 
that someone may have beaten him to it. Medieval spurs, fragments of swords, and a Templar cross. Artifacts associated with the Knights Templar. We found something. Show us. Lead on. It was definitely found that the Knights Templar of the 12th century were there, but there is no evidence as to precisely what they were doing. Or what they found. Here. This is it. Here. Here. Legends say within the very ruins of the temple, the Copper Scroll led them to one of Christendom's most sought-after treasures. The Holy Grail. In the Middle Ages, the Grail is the subject of countless tales, legends and songs. In some versions, the Grail is a cup or plate used by Christ at the Last Supper. But with so few clues, it could be anything. The Grail is a medieval concept. The Grail in these stories was many different forms. Maybe they're searching for a cup. Others believed it was a special stone that fell from heaven. Another story connects the Grail to the very death of Jesus, the Roman spear that pierced Christ's side. The other candidate for the treasure, if you will, that the Templars were supposedly tunneling for uh, was the head of John the Baptist, which also presumably had been buried there The most controversial theory suggests the treasure the Templars found may have been records of the descendants of Christ. Some people have said that somehow they secreted out a member of the family of Jesus, some relative of the marriage between Jesus and Mary Magdalene. By this theory, the Latin words for Holy Grail, Son Grail, are really a mistranslation of two different words, Song Real, or Royal Blood. Under this theory, Jesus married and had children, and those offspring were the secret of the Grail. There are conspiracy theories, of course, everywhere, so often surrounding the Grail. And surrounding Jesus as well, the story that Jesus and Mary Magdalene were surely married. I happen to think it's false, but it's perfectly reasonable. But the royal blood theory makes more sense than a relic being the source of Templar power. Proving Jesus had married and had children would shake the very foundation of Christianity and threaten the entire power structure of medieval Europe. The church would surely pay any price to suppress this information, or so the theory goes. No one knows what the Templars may have found, but there's little question about what happened next. Hugh de Payon, the head Templar leaves the Holy Land to attend the Council of Troyes in France. No one knows what was discussed, only the outcome. Pope Honorius II gives the Templars his blessing. His successor, Pope Innocent, gives them unprecedented power. The Templars now enjoy immunity from the laws, regulations and taxes of every nation. The Templars become a force unto themselves. The Templars' mysterious new power gives rise to many conspiracy theories.
books like the Da Vinci Code suggest the Templars blackmailed the Vatican, demanding special privileges in return for suppressing the bloodline of Jesus. But most scholars simply ascribe their sudden success to good connections. Evidence of their financial clout and influence still stands today. The Templars were openly involved in financing and constructing most of the major Gothic cathedrals of the 12th and 13th centuries. They almost certainly financed the entire building of Chartres Cathedral. Financially, it would have been the equivalent of the American moonshot back in the late 60s. One of the finest Templar churches stands in the heart of London. Called the London Temple, it displays the Templar seal, two men riding a single horse. Unlike most medieval churches, this one is round. Such a church was designed to recreate the sanctity of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, the destination of every pilgrim, the most sacred place on earth, and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre is round. This wasn't just a church, it was a treasury. The King of England came here to the London Temple and removed 50,000 pounds sterling in 1307. It was like walking into Fort Knox and taking off with the gold. Huge resources were being managed and administered, uh, apparently honestly and effectively, by the Templars. Throughout Europe, the cash-rich Templars begin to lend money to cash-strapped nobles. The Templars had an edge over other Christian lenders they could charge interest. In Europe in the Middle Ages, very few people were allowed to transact with money because it was supposedly a sin, simony and usury, to lend money at an interest. The Templars may have created the idea of the check and the line of credit. Pilgrims traveling to the Holy Land or other places would deposit money in a local Templar treasury. In return, a receipt showing the amount deposited. You would finally make it to your destination. You would then cash in what amounts to a medieval traveler's check concept. This was like an early letter of credit. Convenient, but costly. The Templars charged up to 10% for this service. The Templars vowed themselves to a life of poverty, but that didn't seem to affect their bottom line. How did the Templars reconcile their worldly riches with their beliefs? The individual knights took vows of poverty, so they themselves did not own property. They themselves were not wealthy, but the order was allowed to hold that money in order to conduct its own businesses. By the late 1200s, the Knights Templar are one of the richest and most powerful organizations in Europe. But envy and anger follow them, and a ruthless plot is set in motion. The Knights Templar is one of the most powerful organizations in Europe. But there's trouble ahead. The Crusades made the Knights Templar, and the Crusades are about to destroy the Knights Templar. Muslim armies converge on the Holy Land. After two centuries of warfare, Muslims are newly united under the Egyptian sultans. Support for the Crusades dwindles back in Europe. The Crusades over a period of time became more expensive and in both life and resources uh, for Europe and began to look less and less like the kind of thing that would work in the long run.
Muslims crush the Crusaders at the battles of Jaffa, Al-Mansura, and the siege of Safid. By 1290, the Templars hold only one castle in the Holy Land. At the Siege of Acre, they lose that one too. The Holy Land is again occupied by Muslims. The Templars retreat to the island of Cyprus. After the fall of Acre in 1291, you have a serious disillusionment with the idea of the Crusades. As the common populace saw the resources of Europe and the resources of the military going towards these holy wars that seemed to be futile, the role of the Templar seemed to be less tenable. The order's fate lies with a new leader, the French nobleman Jacques de Molay. He lobbies for a new crusade launched from Cyprus, but to no avail. Thirteen o seven, de Molay arrives at the Paris headquarters of the Knights Templar. He was asked to come to France by Pope Clement V in order to reassess their finances and in order to discuss their future endeavors. And it just happened that he showed up in France at a time when Philip IV, Philip the Fair, was experiencing a great deal of economic hardship. Philip is known as the Fair for his handsome looks, but he's accumulated huge debts. His wars with England have put France in hock his biggest creditor is none other than the Knights Templar. Guy? Philip decides to wipe out his loans with one stroke. Yes, my lord. Arrest the Templars and I seize their see. money. Bring them to the dungeons on the Louvre. The king <laughs> concocted a group of charges and Make haste. accused the Templars of, of, you know, the most vile forms of heresy known to the medieval mind. Friday the 13th of October, 1307. Some believe the modern superstition of Friday the 13th hails from this date. In just one day, Jacques de Molay and hundreds of French Templars are rounded up. Jacques de Molay, by the order of the king, you are under arrest. By what charge? Heresy. The arrests shock Europe. Today, it might be as though we all woke up one morning, turned on the television, and heard that every single executive of, of every bank or corporation had been suddenly rounded up at dawn. I mean, it was that of that magnitude. The investigation of the accused begins in the usual way. Torture isn't the penalty for crime. It's a tool to extract a confession. The most common form of torture was the rack. A rack was simply three triangulated boards with a rope attached to a winch, and the idea was to dislocate the wrists and the ankles. In Paris alone, over 100 Templars are tortured, including their elderly grandmaster, Jacques de Molay. Oh, I confess! I confess my sin of heresy! There were 127 accusations levied against the Knights Templar. They included everything from denying Christ, spitting on the crucifix, defecating on the host, waving their bottoms at the Eucharist, kissing each other on the bottoms during their initiation rites. Hundreds of Templars confess, including the Grand Master. But the confessions go beyond the original charges, moving from the odd to the bizarre. Night after night confesses to strange religious practices, including the worship of an unusual object. 
There are a lot of suggestions that this was, in fact, the skull of John the Baptist. Others have suggested that the severed head on the silver platter is, in fact, the Holy Grail. The stories get stranger as Templars independently tell similar bizarre stories. Several Templars confess to worshipping the Baphomet, or Baphomet. The Baphomet is probably one of the most spectacular aspects of the accusations against the Templars. Some have suggested that this is a stone idol of the devil, which was one of the most sensational aspects of their trial, trying to link them in some way with demon worship. Other theories abound. There are some scholars who suggest that Baphomet is actually a mistranslation of Muhammad, that the Templars were actually combining a number of different religious traditions in their own practice. Thousands of Templars served for many years in the Holy Land. Some may have secretly absorbed religious beliefs from the Muslims, like reverence for the Prophet Muhammad, or Baphomet. The strange term still mystifies historians. In the early 1980s, a scholar named Hugh Schoenfield made a startling claim. Baphomet is a coded message. Dr. Hugh Schoenfield, who's a famous Dead Sea scholar, has worked on this issue about the word Baphomet with using the Atbash cipher from biblical studies. The Atbash cipher was an ancient Hebrew encoding technique in use since at least 500 BCE. When the Atbash cipher is applied to Baphomet, a new word emerges. Sophia, Greek for wisdom. To venerate wisdom isn't heresy, unless the wisdom itself is heretical. Sophia is the ancient Greek name for a goddess worshipped by an early Christian sect, the Gnostics. Sophia appears in several Gnostic Gospels as the creator of the world, a figure greater even than Jesus. But the Gnostic beliefs are deemed heretical, and their Gospels are banned by the Church. Some scholars suggest the Templars discovered these Gospels and resurrected a lost form of Christianity. Was Baphomet code for goddess worship? Here, two theories converge. Some Gnostic Gospels say the goddess Sophia came to Earth in the body of Mary Magdalene. Under the royal blood theory, Mary Magdalene carried the bloodline of Jesus. She became the vessel of holy blood, the grail itself. In their written charter, the Templars dedicate themselves not to Jesus, but to Mary. The question that has often come up is, who was the Mary? Was it the Blessed Virgin Mary, meaning the Mother of God, or was it, in fact, St. Mary Magdalene. If the Templars worshipped Mary Magdalene as equal to Jesus, it's one of the worst kinds of heresy. The question still lingers. The Templar Charter is dedicated to Mary, but doesn't say which one, or whether she was worshipped as a goddess. Again, there are unanswered questions, yes, but there isn't yet any documentable evidence that the Knights Templar worshipped Mary Magdalene. It's just not there. Under torture, the Templars may have confessed to practicing a heretical goddess religion, worshipping an idol, or even worshipping a human head. More likely, the Templars were innocent scapegoats for a king who decided to wipe away his debts. King Philip demands the heretics face justice. I have here numerous eyewitness accounts of acts of heresy in name and deed. Reluctantly, the Pope agrees. In 1314, the Knights Templar are officially disbanded. 
March 18, 1314. After seven years of imprisonment and torture, Grandmaster Jacques de Molay is executed as an unrepentant heretic. With his dying breath, it is said de Molay put a curse on the Pope and the King. In a year, I shall see you both in a tribunal before God. Within a year, both are dead. After 200 years, the Templars are no more. Their castles are taken and their great wealth mysteriously disappears. The Templar treasure that King Philip le Bel had seen with his own eyes, by the time his men got there to take possession of it, it had vanished. Nobody knows what happened to the wealth of the Templars after they were suppressed. It has been suggested that two great carts of treasure were carted out of Paris right before the final arrest on Friday the 13th. And from that point onwards, the Templars vanished from the record. We know that the Templars survived, or at least that some Templars survived. They had adequate warning uh, every place but France. And even in France, we know that some Templars escaped. One theory claims a few Templars slipped out of Paris with their treasure. To this day, its whereabouts remain unknown, but a clue survives. This is Roslyn Chapel near Edinburgh, Scotland. In the thriller The Da Vinci Code, the chapel appears as one of the key clues to the hiding place of the Holy Grail. A medieval church and a lost treasure may be linked by one man. Roslyn Chapel, this magnificent building, was built in 1446 by William Sinclair. Sir William Sinclair is an enigmatic figure. Though he built the chapel almost 150 years after the Templars were officially disbanded, it has a tremendous amount of Templar symbolism. Two riders on a single horse is a symbol of the Templars. It appears in Roslyn. As does the Templar seal, the Lamb of God holding a cross. Throughout the chapel, mysterious engravings, symbols, signs, faces. Being coded very cleverly within its artwork are little triggers that say, look closer, there are hidden messages here. The predominant floor plan for medieval churches was the shape of the cross. But Roslin's design appears to be modeled after another famous structure. The chapel's layout and architecture give a clue to its inspiration. With 14 freestanding pillars, including two majestic pillars in front, it resembles the ancient Jewish temple described in the Bible. William Sinclair apparently built his chapel to match the original Jerusalem temple. The ruins of this ancient structure was the site of the first headquarters of the Knights Templar. In Herod's temple itself, there were three floors beneath the temple floor. If this nave of the choir is Herod's temple, then you have to take that little bit of a leap and say there are three floors beneath here. There is no evidence for that. There'd be no proof of it, no record of it. But if you can believe the story so far, then it's not too difficult to go that extra step. More evidence links the chapel to the Templars. Some have theorized that there may be sealed chambers or vaults below Roslyn Chapel. They may hold one of the world's greatest mysteries, the Templar treasure, the Holy Grail, or perhaps nothing at all. The secret has been speculated on, anything from the mummified head of Christ to the Ark of the Covenant to possibly scrolls from the Temple of Jerusalem, but no concrete Archival evidence yet has emerged to prove anything like that. 
and they have yet to be fully excavated. But exploratory excavation has been ruled out for fear the old chapel would collapse. The vaults may simply be tombs, or they may be a treasure trove. The chapel may simply be an eccentric church, or it may be a replica of the Temple of Jerusalem. Roslin remains an unsolved mystery, like so much of the Templar's legacy. Yet evidence suggests someone knows. A mysterious international organization with its own secrets. Some claim the fabulous treasure of the Knights Templar is just waiting to be dug up. Skeptics say the fortune doesn't exist. Others say the treasure is closely guarded by modern Templars. The Knight Templars have always existed. I think probably you'll find that they never actually ceased to exist. They just went underground. Some believe they flourished for centuries in a brotherhood as powerful as it is secret. Clues to its identity lie in plain sight in Roslyn Chapel. In the Lady Chapel behind me, we have carvings on which are at the bottom of the niches of the statue holders. And these have hand positionings which are quite significant, the hand on the chest or the, the feet splayed out, hands on knees. All signs of the Freemasons, one of the largest and oldest fraternal organizations in the world. Fourteen American presidents have been Freemasons. Many of the founding fathers, including George Washington, were Freemasons. The Freemasons keep their rituals secret, but over the years, illustrations and descriptions have leaked out. They show an uncanny resemblance to the Knights Templar. Nowhere is that connection more clear than on the walls of Roslyn Chapel. A figure wearing the distinctive cross of a Templar holds a rope tied around the neck of a blindfolded man. nearly identical to the Freemasons' initiation ritual. Other similarities abound. A Freemason ritual describes the excavation of the ancient Jewish temple, the first headquarters of the Knights Templar. The Templars and Masons are even linked by blood. Before he took a vow of celibacy, Templar founder Hugh de Peon had married into the Sinclair family of Scotland. 300 years later, William Sinclair built Roslyn Chapel, and in the 18th century, the Sinclairs were listed as the hereditary leaders of Scottish Freemasonry. Some Freemason organizations use Templar code words and symbols. One of the highest ranks in the Masonic hierarchy is Knight Templar. The Freemason Youth Organization is called Demolay, the name of the last Grand Master of the Knights Templar. Perhaps the Freemasons are modern Templars, or maybe it's all just a coincidence. There's all kinds of people who pattern their spiritual, social, and structural activity of their groups on these Templar ideals. Thou art a warrior of God. The walls of Roslyn Chapel suggest the Templars were here 150 years after they supposedly vanished. The same walls suggest the Freemasons were here 250 years before they were officially founded. Legend says the cryptic codes of Roslyn Chapel hold a greater secret. The key to the Templars' rumored treasure, the Holy Grail. Roslyn, I think, is an enigma. I think Roslyn was probably designed to be an enigma. No one has cracked the code of Roslyn. No one has found hidden treasure. And no one can prove the Templars were ever here. Seven hundred years after their demise, the Knights Templar remain a mystery. Their secrets still hidden. Their codes 
unbroken. Some say there's nothing to find. They found no great secret on the Temple Mount. They bequeathed no great secret to the Masons. But the Templars were monks who were knights, but that was the limit of their mystery. What we do know is that the Knights Templar were the holiest warriors in Christendom, yet they were punished for heresy. They were shrewd and innovative businessmen, but their methods created powerful enemies. They were fabulously wealthy, but their fortune disappeared with them. They were rumored to possess an explosive secret, and there is a cottage industry of conspiracy theorists and best-selling novels that question if that secret is still guarded today. The answer is we simply don't know. No matter what anyone tells you, we simply do not know. There is always going to be a secret of the Templars because so little is known about their fate. And as long as that past remains shrouded in mystery, there will always be secrets to find. The Knights Templar had a secret, that much we know. But would it still be as earth-shaking today? We may never know. 700 years after the Templars disappeared, their elusive secret is just as enticing. And it is that mystery that may allow the legend of the Knights Templar to live forever.